you uh, for how good you are to us. And I thank you for the life you've given us, Lord. We have so much hope. We have so much joy because of you. And uh, we just praise your holy name. May Jesus be glorified today. Will, will you send your spirit to speak through Pastor Don and open up our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us and just go out in the power of Christ throughout our week, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. If you came here this morning without a Bible, um, if you raise your hand, we'll get you one, and you can follow along, and hopefully I have glasses. Uh, Ooh, that's not good. Okay, that's one down. There's like three pairs, so we got three chances here. Uh, (laughs) All right. Ooh. All right, we got a little bit of an issue here. What the heck? Well, we'll get we'll get these a shot, uh, unless my son Daniel would like to go out to the car. And there's a pair of black glasses in there. <laughs> I could try them too. So anyway, being that I can't see, uh, anybody need a Bible? Raise your hand. We uh, okay. Um, so just to get this out of the way so nobody has to keep asking me because I a- answer the question. Oh, sure. Well, they look like women's. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, my normal glasses are not in here. They're empty. Okay. All right, who's playing the game here? So anyway, just to answer this question so that uh, I don't get asked more. Um, Monday, uh, well, the week before, uh, started having chest pains again and had them all week. Uh, Couldn't figure out what was going on, tired. Uh, So then uh, last Sunday I was here, if you noticed, uh, sort of here. actually went home Sunday night and um, had chest pains through the whole night. It kept waking me up and I kept taking my nitroglycerin pills and it would work for about a half hour and then it would come back. And um, So Monday morning I woke up and uh, Lynn and I went to the uh, hospital and uh, went to Banner Heart and uh, they checked me in and uh, they took an EKG and uh, anyway, uh, at one point, it got pretty ugly. Uh, they had to give me morphine because I was in such pain. Um, six hours later, they came in and said, hey, we got good news and we got bad news. The good news is you're not having a heart attack. Well, it sure feels like it. Uh, the bad news is you're bleeding internally. So because of the lack of blood and the lack of oxygen, uh, that's what was causing my uh, chest pains. So uh, let's see, they put me in a room and the next day they went down through uh, my mouth into my stomach to see if they could find where the bleeding was coming from and they couldn't. Um, All through this, they had to stop my... Uh, medicine that I was taking so that my stints that I had put in in November uh, didn't clog up. So there was kind of like a conflict between the cardiologist and the GI guy who wanted to f- try to find the, um, the leak. And so uh, hopefully these are better. Like really well, <laughs> and so... Um, They had to wait a couple of days all through this. I'm still bleeding and not taking my medicine. So my concern was not necessarily the bleeding, but it was the, you know, am I going to clog up again real quick and then have another heart attack? And So anyway, uh, they they didn't find anything when they went down through, and then Wednesday came along, and and, uh, uh, they said, okay, so tomorrow we're going to do another procedure, and we're going to go in the other way. Okay, (laughs) 
Great, I'm looking forward to that. I, I, the, actually, the worst part about it was drinking that nasty stuff. It was gross. It was salty. So my wife had a great idea. You know, let's get some Jello and we'll mix it with the Jello, and then it won't taste so bad, which did work. Um, <coughs> so uh, that was uh, Wednesday night into Thursday, and they went down through that way, and they found absolutely nothing. So they filled me up with somebody's blood, and here I am. So I feel pretty good, being that you asked. Uh, I feel good until the blood runs out, and then we're going to start having chest pains again, which I'm really not looking forward to. But they do have an idea. And that idea is they're going to give me this capsule that has a camera in it. Now, the first thing I thought was, was uh, the fantastic voyage. Those of you who are around my age, remember that? They took the little submarine and going through there, yeah. Or uh, what was the other one? Osmosis Jones with Bill Murray, you know, when they went down, yeah, anyway. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking. Anyway, this, this capsule is supposed to film the inside of me and, and try to find out where the blood is. So where it's coming from, where the leak is. So that's where it stands right now. Uh, I found out there's, there's, I think, a couple of, there's only a couple of people who give you that pill, and we know who one of them is, but they, uh, they don't take my insurance. So I'm thinking, you know, the heck with the insurance and the doctors, let's see what the Lord can do. So in saying this to you guys, just pray, 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 pray. And it's not only for me, but it's like Bob, who for the last week and a half after his back surgery, wherever Bob is, I saw him hobble in today over there, okay. Uh, I won't point him out, but he's right over there just on the other side of the post. Um, and, 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 and there's so many. Sandy, who's been struggling, and I know Larry's been struggling, and there's so many of us, and we need to pray for one another, not just today, but we need to do it daily. And something that my wife said is I was pretty frustrated laying there in the hospital, not you know, I just spent four days in there. It just cost me seven or eight thousand dollars out of my pocket, and uh, and I'm wondering, Lord, what's going on? What's the purpose of this? And something that my wife said is, you know, we all go through things, and you know what? If this builds our faith, then it's worth it. It's worth the spending the time in the hospital, and it was fun having you guys come visit. That was great. Uh, those that did. And, uh, but, you know, we have to pray for one another because, you know, our Lord and Savior is a great physician, isn't he? And he can do anything. And what he's going to do with me, I have no idea. But I will tell you this, and I haven't said anything to my wife. I was going to tell her this morning, and the Lord said, no, let, let's find out together. So in the last three days since they've let me go, I have not been bleeding. So, let's see what the Lord's going to do, right? Because he's awesome, and he can do whatever he wants. And you know what? If it makes a difference that we have to get down on our knees, if we walk away like James, the brother of Jesus, and we have camel knees... And when we go into the coffin, they have to kind of break them to get them in there because, you know, they couldn't bend them because he was so stiff. So let's pray, and we pray for one another. And, and you know what? It, it's not me. There's so many. Uh, David has been fighting with stuff for a long time. There's, all of us have been facing stuff. But, you know, we have the avenue to go before God himself and say, you know what? I, I'm struggling with this. I don't know what you're doing. I'm having a hard time. I can't, I can't walk. I can't get around. I'm shortness of breath. My chest hurts all the time. I can't sleep at night because my heart's just pounding. The, the, my heartbeat pounding in my ears. Lord, what are you doing? Show me what you're doing. But thank you for what you're doing because I know you only have my good in mind. And he always does. And sometimes we can get down. And, but I'll tell you one of the things that, that really kind of 
uh, made me okay with all of this is you guys and knowing that you were praying for me those that came to the hospital and would come and see me and and pray with me it's awesome I will, I will tell you one other thing. My sister texts me out of the blue. We don't talk very often. And she says, and, and she's a Catholic, and she says, you know, I've been praying for you for over a week. Are you okay? About an hour later, when? Maybe? The next day, I get a phone call. I missed the phone call because I was talking to or texting with another pastor, uh, actually Mike McIntosh, as he was on his way to uh, Yuma. And uh, I missed the phone call, so I went back and listened to the voice message. And it was, I don't know if you know who he is, but uh, Sandy Adams from uh, Georgia, a uh, longtime pastor. I don't know him. I've met him a couple of times. I did ask him if he would come uh, here uh, for Valentine's this past year, and then the Lord said, you're not doing Valentine's. It's too, much, it's too hard on your heart. So we didn't do it this year, but I wanted him to come and be the guest speaker. And uh, he calls me out of the blue, and he says, the Lord put you on my heart this morning. How are you doing? I'm like, wow, okay. I get it, Lord. You love me a whole bunch. Much more than I thought of just before that. My sister out of the blue and Sandy Adams. It's pretty cool, isn't it? So anyway, enough about that. Let's get to what, why we came. All right, we'll give these a try. Well, I w you know the other way I was just going to say if you guys just read it and then we'll, we'll talk about it. But... I could set this on the floor and read it, but uh, I don't, okay, so we're not going to do that. Hey, so last week we saw just something just so awesome, so awesome, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, this is that Word, and without Him, that Word, nothing was made that was made. In Him, that Word was life, and the life was the light of men, or uh, in Him was the source of all life. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then we drop down to an awesome verse, 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That Word that was in the beginning that was with God and that was God, that created all things, was who? Jesus Christ. Awesome. And as I've said before, when, I've, when I got saved, uh, I talked with a guy, he gave me his Bible, he sent me home, he told me to read John, I read that, I got down to verse 14, and I found out, even though I was a Catholic, and I believed that he was the Son of God, I really didn't know he was God. But Jesus is God. Jesus Christ is God. And he became flesh and dwelt among us. How awesome is that? You know, you think about it. God, to stoop down, to, co to come out of heaven, to stoop down, to come down here, to be ridiculed and beaten, his beard pulled out, to be crucified, put a crown of thorns, that his own would not believe him that who he was. See, God had a plan that he himself would come down to bring man back to himself. It's what he did for us. That's what he did for us. So he sent his son Jesus, God, part of the Trinity, down to us 
And as we pick up this morning in verse 19 of chapter 1 of the book of John, it says, And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? Now, this is not John the Apostle, the writer of this book. But this is John the baptizer who we went, we talked about a little bit last week. In verse 6 it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. John the baptizer. Although when you look at uh, the Holy Spirit's analogy of John, uh, through the apostle John, and he, John over and over talked about him as being what? A witness. He saw with his own eyes. He was a witness. He was a witness to the light. He was a witness and for the purpose of all through him might believe. But he was a witness of Jesus Christ. Now let's, I, I don't want to focus really on John, but I want to turn back to Luke chapter 1 and, and talk just for a few minutes about John so that we have an understanding of him, of how God led him even, even know the things that he did in his life previously to this, not that they, they were bad, but when you look at this guy and you think, this guy? This guy's a crackpot. He's a hippie out in the middle of the desert, eating bugs. Well, he was smart enough to dip him in honey, kind of kill the taste and maybe the thought of what it was, but... <clears throat> So in, in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth. So he was a priest because his great, 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 or his descendant, or uh, whatever, his great, great, grandfather, father in the spirit, uh, was uh, Abraham, so he was a priest. And it says, and they were both righteous before God. Now, it doesn't mean that they didn't sin. That's not what it's talking about here. They had a right standing before God, in the, in, uh, not in the spiritual sense, but in the physical sense. So he's righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So they were old. They were old. They were past the years of childbirth and she was barren as well. So it was that while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division. Now what they would have is if you were a descendant and you were a priest and they would draw lots out and they would say, okay, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do this in the priesthood, uh, whatever, whatever it be. You're gonna bring the showbread or you're gonna light the, uh, um, the incense or whatever the case may be. And you would, you would do this job for a year and then you'd be done. You would serve in the temple for a year, and then you would be finished. And so according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, what, he, what you would do is, is the priest, if you were the one that would light the incense, you would come in, and all and you would walk straight through. You'd have the showbread on the right, you'd have the candles on the left, and, or the, the oil to light, and uh, in front of you would be the incense, and it was right before the veil, okay, that only the high priest could go through the veil one time a year, and that was after he sacrificed not only for himself and his sin, but also for all the people. So you would walk in, and here was the altar of incense in front of you, and you would light it. Now that incense, and, and, and the idea behind this is as the incense burned, it was prayers that were going up to the Lord. Now aren't you glad we don't have to do that? You know, if I want to talk to the Lord, I just stop and I talk to him. And we can all do the same. We don't have to walk in there walk into the Holy of Holies and burn incense. But this was his job. 
This was his job was to do that. Now jump down to verse 11, and it says, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And now this angel will find out, or I don't think we're going to look, we're going to read that part, but this angel was Gabriel. Um, An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. How awesome. You know, every prayer that we have is heard by God. Did you know that? It's not like we say to him, hey, aren't you listening to me? Oh, he's listening. He knows. Everyone is heard. Everyone might not be answered right away. The answer might be no. The answer might be yes, but the worst answer is wait. (sighs) I'm impatient. I don't know about you. I want the Lord to answer me now. You know, when I read the, uh, uh, the prayer requests, and those of you who are not on the prayer request list, you know there's a piece of paper over there. Fill out, put your email in there, drop it in the box, and you'll know what's going on. You'll know what's going on. But I, I, you know, when I see that somebody's sick or somebody needs something, I, I always expect the Lord to answer it right away. Right away. But you know, I also know that sometimes things have to play their course. God's working it out for the good. And maybe if he answered today, it wouldn't be as good as if he answered tomorrow. We do understand that, right? You know, as I was having these chest pains and I'm laying in bed and I'm having to down these stupid nitroglycerin pills that really give you a headache, so I had my little bottle of uh, uh, peppermint, and I like the smell of peppermint, and you put it on your head, try to get it to take the the headache away, which it usually does pretty quick. Um, and, And I'm asking the Lord, Lord, why am I going through this? What's going on? What is going on? Just like I ask them when I see that some of you are sick and some of you are struggling and I ask the same question, Lord, what's going on? But see, we trust in the Lord enough that he's going to do something, isn't it? And I know this for a fact, that the Lord's going to heal me if he already has not. I know that. Whether he uses a doctor, whether he doesn't, whether he just says, that's it, no more bleeding, or because I know he's going to do it. I know for a fact he will, and it might not be here, but it'll be on the way up when I get my new body, because there ain't no bleeding in that puppy. (laughs) Amen? Amen. So, okay. So here he is. he's, He's standing before uh, at the altar of incense, and, and he, here Zacharias is troubled, and the angel said, don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. Jump down to verse 15. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him. Who's the him? It's Jesus, God. (coughs) In the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He was going to be the one to prepare the hearts of the people for the coming of the Messiah. John, John the baptizer, John the witness. He wasn't a Baptist. He really wasn't. He was a baptizer or a witness. Verse 20 says, but behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. So Zacharias, a lot like uh, Abraham's wife, didn't believe. 
Well, hey, you're past that age. You're going to have a son. You've been barren all your life. Oh, yeah, right, okay. Yeah, nice try. <clears throat> yeah. Turn over to verse 80. Chapter 1, the last verse of chapter 1 of the book, book of Luke, and it says this. So the child grew and became strong in the spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his mani manifestation to Israel, eating bugs dipped in honey. He looked like an old hippie out in the desert. People probably thought he was crazy. People did think he was crazy. And here he comes. This is the John that we're talking about here, not only in verse 6, the man sent from God, but here in verse 19, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Well, what is he talking about? Well, let's go to the last book of the Old Testament, which, ladies, that on Tuesday night, what's that book? Malachi, unless you're Italian, it would be Malachi. So <clears throat> go to the last book and the last chapter, and we're gonna pick up in verse five. It says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of what? The great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So what is he saying? Before the Messiah comes, will come who? Elijah. Now, a couple of things here. Literally, John was Elijah because he came before who? He came before Jesus. But not entirely because Elijah will come before the coming of Jesus Christ when he steps foot on the earth at his second coming. And this is what he's talking about. He says, look, he says, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, interesting, kind of tell you a little thing. Uh, that when, the, when the Jews read this, they read it like this. And the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse, and the hearts of the children to their fathers because they didn't want to end on a bad note. Oh, we don't want to end on a curse. So we're going to add to the Bible here a little bit, just a little bit, you know. It's, a, it's biblical right there, but it's not the same if you put it at the end because God meant it the way he said it. So anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there for you so that you knew, just in case you ever hear that. So he's not, he says, no, I'm not Elijah. And he says, hey, are you the prophet? And he says, no, well, what is he talking about? Well, back in Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, uh, chapter 18 uh, and verse 15. 18, 15, yes. Eighteen fifteen says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, who's speaking, Moses. Moses is saying, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. So they, the Jews expected another. They expected a, a, <coughs> a prophet. Now, if you remember when when God was giving the people the Ten Commandments, okay, on Mount Sinai, and he's going through and he's speaking to them in the, in the cloud and in the thunder. 
And what did they do? They started screaming and covering their ears. Oh no, if you give me one more commandment, my head's gonna bust. I'm gonna blow up. Please, don't speak to us. Speak to Moses. Let Moses tell us. And that's what they did. See, they didn't want to hear from God. They wanted to hear from a man. You know, in reality, it's a big stumbling block for them today. Because when Jesus talks about, in Matthew, about uh, him being that prophet that is spoken of here, they're like, oh, well, we can't accept you as a Messiah because you're a man. So it's a stumbling block for them. But see, here, they didn't want to hear from God. They wanted Moses to do it. Do you want to hear from God? Because, boy, I'll tell you what, you sure don't want me to tell you. And you sure don't want any of your friends or anybody else. You want to hear from God. You want to listen to what he has to say. You want to know his voice to where when he speaks, you know it's him. This is, this is the relationship that we want, isn't it? You know, when you first fell in love with your spouse, boy, you, could, you wanted to hear from them all the time, didn't you? Before you went to bed, that was the last person you wanted to hear from. When you woke up in the morning, who was the first person you wanted to hear from? Exactly. Now you're old and married, and it's like, come on. But, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I'm just saying, look, we, we want to hear from God. We want to hear his voice. We want to know what it sounds like. We want to hear what he has to say to us. How many times have we said, Lord, just tell me what to do. I don't know. I got things going on in my life. I don't know what to do. Do I choose this door or this door or this door? Do I take this medication, that medication, this medication? We want God to tell us, don't we? We want to be sure. Well, we can be, but that comes with a relationship. Just when you, uh, when you, when you, like when you were dating and you heard that voice and that's what you wanted to hear and, 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 and as time went on, you knew the voice of your spouse and that's what we need to do. We spend time in this book so that we can have a deeper relationship so that we can understand what he's saying to us. Don't we want that? So... <clears throat> They asked him, are you, are you this prophet? Are you, are you Elijah? Are you the Christ, the Messiah? And he said, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? What, you know, what is it that you're saying about yourself? Who are you? What authority do you come to baptize these people? Because in reality, this is how it was. The Jews or a Jew would not really get baptized. Okay? They would have, uh, they would get washed by the water. When they, they were unclean, they would get washed, but they wouldn't get baptized. The baptisms were for the Gentiles they were for the Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism. They would baptize them in repentance for their sins that they did as a Gentile. So here is John who comes on the scene, and what's he doing? He is baptizing Jews for repentance of their sins. Wait a minute, you can't do that. The only one who can do that is God. God. God's the only one that can do that. So this was a big stumbling block for them. They're looking at this guy. Hey, look at this hippie who wears this leather belt who's eating these bugs. Dipped in honey. Now can you imagine that? You know, you know he didn't shave, right? He's got this big beard, long hair. He had to have four or five locusts 
stuck in his beard from the honey that he dipped them in. Now, I don't know whether he was saving them for later or they just kind of dropped down. But who the heck are you? This guy? Please. And he said to them, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight or get ready the way of the Lord. See, this was John the baptizer's mission, wasn't it? Is to make way for the coming Messiah, the king, the king that was coming. Prepare the way of the Lord. In other words, hey, get your act together. Get cleaned up. Because he's coming. Now, um, that's Isaiah chapter 40, if you wanted to know. And it says this in 24. It says, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were a sect of Judaism. They were leaders. Uh, they, they believed in the oral law. They always had an outward appearance of goodness and righteousness. But if you remember, in the other uh, Gospels, when we were going through the book of uh, Matthew, what did Jesus call them all the time? You hypocrites. Because that's what they were. On the outside, they look good. But what did he call them? You guys are whitewashed tombs. Whitewashed tombs. You're a hypocrite. And John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. He, he's here. He stands among you but you don't know who he is. It is he, Jesus, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Now only one who could undo the sandal strap was the lowest slave, the very lowest slave that there possibly was. That's the only one who could undo the strap. Interesting. Uh, well, we'll get to it when we get there. Uh, verse 28. These things were done in Bethbara, which means house of passage, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now, if you remember back in uh, when we were in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 4, uh, when they were crossing over the Jordan River to go into the promised land, God told Joshua, go out into the Jordan and get 12 stones and pile them up on the land, the 12 stones, and then take 12 stones from the land into the Jordan River and pile them up. Why? As a memorial. Well, this is the place that is being spoken of here. Here in Bethbara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. You know, it's interesting as we read a lot of stuff in the Old Testament, uh, certainly when we went through the book of Leviticus and, and it was like Leviticus and Numbers, come on, really, do we have to go through them too? Well, yeah, because see, God points out things to us to give us landmarks or spots or something that we can remember. So here, he's baptizing at Bethbara beyond the Jordan. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. Now, I just want to throw this in there so that you know. This is about six weeks after Jesus was baptized that this happened. If you remember... Uh, Go to Mark chapter 1. Verse 9. 
And it says this, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So what happens? Jesus gets baptized, and he's off for 40 days in the desert being tempted by Satan. Now he comes back. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, Jesus said that John, the baptizer, the witness, was the greatest prophet. Why? Because he was the last prophet. He not only prophesied about the coming Messiah, but he also saw him, which made him the greatest prophet. So John says, look, behold, look, look upon the Lamb of God. This Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world. He proclaimed Jesus' mission right there, right? This Lamb would take away the sins of the world. Now turn with me to Revelation chapter 13. Verse 8. It says this, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from when? The foundations of the earth. See, God had a plan, didn't he? And the plan was to get you and me, us stumbling, bumbling human beings that fall flat on our face, do stupid things, say dumb things to get us to come back to him. This was his plan. When? Well, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundations of the earth. Turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 3. So we're going to go from the end to the beginning. And we're going to be in verse 21. It says, now this is after the fall. God had already pronounced judgment on um, Satan. Um, already talked to uh, Eve about what's going to happen to her because the repercussion for what um, she did and that her sorrow would be gro- uh, multiplied greatly in conception um, that she would have a desire to rule over her husband and, and then he talked to Adam and told a man the ground's going to be cursed because of this uh, you're going to die physically because God made us never to die and so this is what's going to happen. You're going to have both thorns and thistles and it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the herb of the field and in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. In other words, you're going to die. And he was 900 and some odd years old, but he did, he did die. He said you were taken out of the dust, dust and you're going to become dust. So then he says, 
uh, to them. And then he and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And in verse 21 it says this. Also, for Adam and his wife, what did the Lord God do? The Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. He covered them with the lamb to cover their sin. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. Just a few pages. I think it's verse 8. Yes. God testing Abraham's faith told him to take his son, his only son, Isaac, who God made many, many promises through, and he told him to take him and bring him before the Lord on Mount Moriah, which is where Jesus ended up, and to offer him as a sacrifice. Now, Abraham loved God. He believed in God. So he thought that, well, you know what? Hey, if I kill my son on that altar, God will resurrect him. And it was a picture of what God the Father had to go through for his son, Jesus Christ, when he hung on that cross. And in verse 8, it says this, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Not only did he provide a lamb, but he would be the lamb, the lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Turn with me to Exodus, so the next book, chapter 12. Verse 1. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, <coughs> On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for the household, the tenth of the month. I believe it was last year. Uh, the tenth of the month was uh, Palm Sunday, which is the day that he's speaking of here. <coughs> And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to the house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses where they eat at. When Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, you saw what? You saw the two Thieves, one on each side, the door, what? Posts and the lentil going across with the Messiah, the King, Jesus Christ, slain in the middle. And what they did is they, they killed the lamb, they slid its throat in the trough that was right before your do door. That, that trough would catch the water so that it didn't flood your house out every time it rained. And this, is what, this is what he's speaking of, the lamb of God. The what? The Passover lamb. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. Here, Isaiah talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We get down to verse 7, and it said he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened on his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears in silence. Jesus Christ went willingly 
as the Lamb of God to be crucified for you and me so that our sins can be forgiven. The ones we've done yesterday, the ones we're going to do today, and the ones we're going to do tomorrow. He was the Lamb of God. See, He not only provided the Lamb, but He was the Lamb. Turn with me back to uh, <coughs> John. Verse 30. This is He of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, John was older, about six months older than Jesus, cousin of Jesus. So if you were older, then you were to have more respect. You were to be respected more by those that were younger. But here... John says this, this is he whom I said after me comes a man who is preferred before me because he was before me. Yes, Jesus exist, existed when? Go back to verse one. In the beginning. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water for repentance. Remember, we talked about this. Most of the time when you would be baptized with water, it was for repentance, and it was usually only used on Gentiles. A Jew was never baptized. They would have to go and dip themselves in the water and wash themselves off so that they could be cleaned. It was a ceremonial thing that they did. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I saw this. I saw God himself in the Holy Spirit come down and set on Jesus. That's how I know. That's how I know who he was. I saw this with my own eyes. I wasn't dreaming it. Remember John in verse 6, it says he was sent from God to prepare the way. He prepared, he prepared the way by way of baptism for repentance. God told him that, hey, whoever this person's going to be, this one that you're preparing the way for, this, the Spirit is going to come like a dove and set on him. That's how you know it's going to be him. That's how you know. And he tells him, look, this is the guy, the one and only. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Look, God said it. I believed it. I saw with my own eyes. I am a witness that God himself came down, became flesh, and dwelt among us will go to the cross because that was his mission and die for our sins so that we could be with him for eternity. And I have seen and testified or bear record that this is the Son of God. This is God himself. God himself. What more can we say? What more could John have done? Hey, I'm here to prepare the way. He's coming. He's coming. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Oh, 
There he is. I saw the Spirit. I saw the Spirit come down. This is him. This is the man. The man, Jesus Christ. The Savior. And he's come to save us from ourselves. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Now think about that. Would you have went through all of that? Could you have even imagined anything like that? But see, God did. God had a plan. And that plan was so that you and you and you and you and you and you and and me and all of us didn't have to spend eternity separated from God. And he's going to implement them plan, that plan. And as we saw, just, just in the short bit today, as we went through Genesis in chapter 3 and after the fall of man, and God already had this plan because remember we read in, in Revelation chapter 13 that God had this plan before the foundations of the earth. So in the beginning, God had already had this plan because he knew what we were going to do. He knew we were going to fall flat on our face, but he loved us so much anyway. He knew that we were going to be an enemy of God, and I was for 27 years. I live my life in darkness, not caring about the things of God, just doing the things that please my flesh. But see, he knew. So from the beginning, he said, that's it. I know what I'm going to have to do. And if you remember, uh, which we're actually going to talk about here in a few weeks, because we've got Easter or Resurrection Sunday coming up, We got Good Friday coming up. And we saw, we, we will see what he had to go through and what he had to do. And hanging on that cross right before he left, right before he committed his spirit, it's finished. It's finished. It's done. Because what? The day before that, he's in the garden in, in, uh, um, Drawing a blank. Anyway, uh, he's praying. He's praying that what? Hey, is there any other way? I know we've had this plan from the beginning. And I know it's been, yeah, 4,000 years since man has been on the earth. And And we got this plan, but is there another way? Well, see, Jesus wasn't trying to get out of it because he loved you. But Jesus was like saying, hey, you know, I really don't want to be separated from my father. So is there another way? But there wasn't, was there? That blood, his blood, the lamb of God, the one who breathed life into us, the one that is the source of life, the one that created all things, the one that was there with the Father had to become flesh and dwell among us so he could pay that price. Hey, that's some real love. You know, he didn't just say it. He did it. And see, his plan was initiated from the beginning. Genesis through Revelation speaks of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Amen? Amen. So we have a choice. We can be a witness unto what God has done. And, and really, in reality, you don't have to be me or some, uh, somebody else who's highfalutin. Uh, you have to be you. See, God made you, you're perfectly and wonderfully made. God has given you a gift. God has given you a mouth. He's given you his word. And when we take this word 
and we read it and we put it in our heart, out of the abundance of our heart, what happens? The mouth speaks. So we have to be a witness unto what we know. And I know for all of us here, unless you, uh, well, and, and really one of the, the, the greatest miracle was what? Our salvation. We were darkness. Now we became light. All because of what Christ has done. We need to speak that. We need to tell people. We need to tell people the love of Christ that he has. You don't have to get into doctrinal things, but people need to know. Hey, if, I, if you fell down in the dumps, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where you're going to go when you die. Oh, well, let's see. Shirley MacLaine said that, you know, I become another person. Maybe I'll be a dog. And then somebody can pick, after, pick up after me for a while, you know. Or maybe I'll be a cat. We had a cat, and he kept peeing on the bed. So what are you going to do? Why? I have no idea. He didn't like us, I guess. I don't know. Or maybe you'll come back as a beetle or a locust, and then John the baptizer can dip you in honey. But there's people out there who don't know. But see, our hope, right, is in Jesus Christ and in the return of him. That's what the scripture says. I didn't make that up. I could try to twist it and change it, but the reality is that's what the scripture says. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. That he died for us. And we need to tell a dying world, time is getting short and I know if you've been a Christian a long time, you've heard that. But you can see it, can't you? You know, 20 years ago, before the cell phones, except the ones that were like this big, that had that antenna, it looked like you were in the army, you know, and hey, <clears throat> you had no cell service. You, you would think, how's the world all going to see this? when all these things in the, in the book of Revelation that are going to happen. How's, how's it, you know? How is Russia going to form an alliance to come down and attack Israel? What purpose do they have in doing that? Huh. You can see it now, can't you? Hey, let me just practice on Ukraine for a while. You know, when you look at Ezekiel chapter 38, you see what's going to happen and the things that are going to go on. You know, if you've been a believer for 30 years or been reading the Bible for that long, you're like, yeah, right. How's that stuff going to happen? Hmm. You see it now, don't you? See, God said it, and it's going to happen. And when God speaks, we believe. So the time is short, and what does God want us to do? Uh, let me ask you a question, and I don't want you to answer but I want you to think about this. If God told you today what day you were going to pass away from this earth, would you want him to tell you? Now think about that just for a moment. Would you want him to tell you? I know I wouldn't want him to tell me. Because I'd wait till the day before and then I'd do a lot of good things and say, oh, I'd be like the Jews. Hey, you know, all year long for 364 days, they argue and fight and backbite against each other. And, and it, when I worked in the, at the rabbin, rabbinical college, this is what they did. So they were all rabbis and they're all arguing with each other and they call people names. They talk behind each other's back. They would do things deliberately to set the guy up, to make him look stupid and stuff. And then the day before, the day of atonement, you know what they would do? They were so nice, and they'd go over to the guy's house, and they'd give, give him his lawnmower back that they took, and, and the stuff they stole from him, and, the, and, the, and they would apologize for all the stupid things they did, and all the stuff backbiting. I, I would be like that. That would be me. I would wait till the last day. But see, the Lord doesn't tell us, because why? Be a busy about our Father's work. And that's what we're supposed to do. 
So I'm glad I don't know, but I sure hope he comes tomorrow. Because right now I'm having a good day. But I don't know what's going to happen when I walk out in that parking lot. So would you want to know? No, thanks. Yeah, but it's up to you whether you would want to know. But see, we're called to be busy about his work. So let's do that. Amen? Amen. So the worship team is going to come up, play one last song. If you need prayer, there'll be uh, people up here to pray with you. Uh, we all need prayer. So man, if you, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in the church today that are, that are hurting things going on in their life. It, it might not be physically, it might be mentally, it might be, you know, some have lost their jobs or they're struggling financially. Whatever the case may be, we need to pray. And if we're, and if we're healthy enough, and I mean that in the sense of, uh, you know, we're healthy spiritually enough to pray for one another, then let's do that. Amen? Let's not, let us not forget our brothers and sisters. So if you'd stand with me, the worship team will come up, we'll pray. So Father, we just, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you gave us this word that we can look and see that in the beginning that you were always there. We see the Trinity through this, Lord. We see that, you, that in Jesus he created all things. We, saw, we see that he became flesh and dwelt among us. We see that he is the Lamb of God who who took away the sins of the world and we are so grateful so father we thank you for bringing us here this morning father i ask that you continue to burn your word in our heart because we need it so father we love you and we praise you father i lift up everyone here who's got health issues who's uh, struggling financially who's uh, maybe struggling with family members, uh, who maybe has some type of a, a sickness, who's maybe struggling with forgiveness, Lord, who maybe sits here and is not sure, the 110% sure that you want us to know. So, Father, I lift them up and I ask that through your Holy Spirit, Lord, you touch them. You show them, you open their eyes, take away the deception of the enemy and fill them with your Holy Spirit. So Father, we love you and we praise you. Father, I ask that you bless each and everyone here from the top of their head to the bottom of their foot. Fill them to overflowing with your Spirit. And when they leak out, Lord, I just ask that you refresh them and refill them. So, Father, we love you and we praise you. We love you and we know that the love that we say is not the agape love. But, Lord, that's what we desire is that agape love for you. So, Father, we love you and we praise you. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all his children said...